Acts chapter 1, starting at verse 4, and it reads, Once, when he was eating with them, he referring to Jesus, he commanded them, Do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Skip to verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. If you would, skip to chapter 2, starting at verse 1. And it reads, On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven, like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then, what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. If you would, as you're taking your seats, help me introduce the title for today's message. Everyone say dessert. dessert. Amen. You may take your seats. Dessert. Some of you were with us a couple of months ago, and I started a message series in our uh, Road to the Cross entitled The Road to the Cross, A Four-Course Meal. In that, I preached on hors d'oeuvres, and I talked about that the origins of Jesus back in John 1 weren't earthly, but they came from heaven. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. And we wanted to see this because this is helping us to understand the work that Jesus did. Then after that, I, I moved on to the next message in the installment entitled Appetizers. And I, I, I communicated that all of the work, Jesus' entire life, all of the miracles, all of the teaching, wasn't even the main course. It literally was the appetizer. That when he fed 5,000 with two fish and five loaves of bread, when he walked upon the water, when he calmed the very storms and the seas, none of that was his apex. It wasn't even the main thing it was just an appetizer. Then on Easter Sunday, I gave us our main course, and I said that our main course, that the, the reason, the very center for why Jesus came was to go to the cross and to be resurrected, resurrected that the, the crucifixion and the resurrection was the main course. And then I stopped. And I was wondering if somebody would come and be like, hey, pastor, you never did finish the four courses. Nobody did. So apparently we was like, oh, it must have been wrapped up in there. No, it must have happened. It didn't. Because as I kept thinking about what could be the fourth course, how do you understand anything after the resurrection, after, I'm sorry, after the crucifixion and resurrection, it is not until Pentecost Sunday. So I literally put a pause in a series to preach a different series to come back to close out the series. Because it is not until we get to Pentecost that we can understand the completion of Jesus' four-course meal on this road to the cross. Now, some of you, you're very familiar with uh, meals. You've gone out to some of the most amazing restaurants, and you know that the, the meal starts off by so many things coming. The waiter or waitress brings different courses out to you. They fill you up with water, and each time the round gets a little bit better. 
the food more engaging until you get to the main course where all of a sudden now the only thing left is the proper utensils. It is the full plate until they ask you, desert anyone. And at this point, you often can opt in or out for dessert. Now, to be very honest, I don't understand the people that say no. <laughs> All of you non-dessert eaters out there, I don't mean to pass judgment. I don't mean to, to try to, to, to look down upon you. However, from my particular perch and the way that God has constructed my body, um, dessert always seems apropos. <laughs> And one of the things that I recognize in looking into what the word dessert means, because for us, the dessert actually is the sweet treat that we get at the end, but that's actually not the origin of the word. That the origin of the word dessert is French, which kind of literally translated means to unserve. It is intended for the servants now to come back, collect all the utensils, collect all the extra food that's available, to clean the table off so that nothing else is left there and prep for the final course. And that when the final course comes out, the entire table has been cleared to signal that this is the end. Nothing else more is needed. Nothing else should be expected. That what you have now not only changed what used to be there, but lets you know that you need no more. And I couldn't help but have my mind blown. Because what, what better way to talk about the spirit of God than to talk about something that no longer cares what has been on the table before. It's not asking about how much you ate before, not asking what utensils you use, but is now clearing it all away to let you know that nothing needs to come after this. Once you get this thing, once this has been dispensed, once this final course comes, you will have everything that you need. Yes, Desert anyone? Yes, sir. Jesus now speaks so amazingly in, in Acts chapter 1 as he's talking to the disciples, as he's preparing for his ascension back to heaven, he says some things that just completely grabbed me. While he was eating with them, they're already at a meal, he tells them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends the gift he promised. Don't leave. Stay here. Wait. Everybody say wait. wait. I've come to find out that God does amazing things in our waiting. However, far too often, we get frustrated in the wait and move too soon. Listen to me, listen to me. Watch this, watch this now. Now, I, 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 I'm not the best theologian. I don't know everything about God, but I know a little something. I know enough to know that God has no need for waiting in himself. The wait is not meant to benefit God in any way because God is fully sufficient. There is no deficiency in God. There is nothing that waiting does for God besides align things to the way that God would desire for them to be aligned. Therefore, the wait can only have a benefit to those who are waiting. Oh, you missed it. 
since God is not held subject to time, he exists in eternity, everything is, was, and will be, is all available to God all at the same time. The only ones that live now predicated about time are the ones who are in time, you and I. Therefore, if there is a time component, it is not for God's benefit, it is always for our benefit. So then, when Jesus is heading back to heaven, it is no reason that I can imagine that the Holy Spirit would not come simultaneously unless God needs to do something with the weight. After all this time of watching Jesus walk through life and do this, in fact, seeing him die, and come back, the disciples still got some work to do. And watch this. The weight is meant to align some things that had not been aligned even while he was here. He says, don't you leave Jerusalem. See, because I know what culture will tell you, that if you want it, you should have it right now. In fact, we have commercials out now that says impatience is a virtue. And whereas I understand of pushing, I understand a, a, a success and achieving. Can I tell you, you got to be careful to the messages that you bring in because sometimes impatience, in fact, never is impatience a virtue. Impatience is never a virtue. It is the patient that is the virtue. It is you learning to wait and not wait for your friend, not just wait for your mama, not just wait for your spouse, but wait upon the Lord to do the work that God wants to do. Sometimes God will make you wait because you ain't ready for what he wants to give you anyway. See, it is in, it is in our wait that we begin to signal our surrender. See, it's in our wait that we begin to declare all of our dependence. It's, it's in our weight that we wave the flag of faith. It is not sometimes until you got to wait on the Lord. And I know, I know this don't, this don't run well. This, don't, this ain't the thing that you tweet real quick. But can I tell you, sometimes God is not being mean to you by making you wait. But God is setting you up for the very pre preparation for all the things that he has available for you. But you ain't ready. And what happens is when we run ahead of God, then we make even worse mistakes. Sometimes you got to sit down, stay at the table and wait for God to show. Don't you leave Jerusalem. Now, they're searching for you in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the hot spot. Jerusalem could potentially make your life precarious. Jerusalem could suggest that you're going to end just like I ended. But listen to me when I tell you, don't you leave Jerusalem. The enemy is trying to make you believe that I can't protect you. The enemy is trying to tell you like your life is on the line. The enemy is trying to make you worry about some stuff I've already handled. But don't you leave Jerusalem. I, I know what you feel. In fact, you probably are tired by now. You got some other work to do at home. You got to figure out your career. You got to work on your family. Don't you leave Jerusalem. Because you know what's going to happen? Everybody ain't going to stay. Not only does the waiting perfect in us, it also begins to perfect the community. <laughs> Watch this. In Acts chapter 2, listen to this. It says, on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven roaring and it filled the house they were in. Then what looked like tongues and fire settled on each of them present, on each of them. Everyone present was filled. Everyone present was filled. 
there are more believers and followers of Jesus than were in the room on the day of Pentecost. But not all of the believers who were followers of Jesus received the full feeling at that moment because they all weren't present. You got to watch believing that your faith is completely spiritual and that you can do it all by yourself because there are some things that God will do that will only happen within community and you are missing out on the fulfilling of the gift of God because you want to be marked absent instead of present. You got to wait because I've lined it up, I've worked it out, and something is coming. But not just something, not just anything. Watch this. There's a wait because you're waiting for the gift. Everybody say the gift. Yes. See, when we talk about dessert, right, it always is sweet. It gives you this thing, but it also communicates something to our bodies that then you can stop and digest and can fully go into process. It is sweet for us because it has a benefit and a beauty. But the same happens with the Spirit of God. Listen to the the ways that Jesus himself describes the very spirit of God. John 14, Jesus describes the spirit of God as the advocate. Some say the helper. The same word is translated as comforter, encourager, and counselor. Let me say it again. Wait for the gift. Well, what is the gift? The advocate, the helper, the comforter, encourager, and counselor. I don't think we're getting it. Jesus says he's not going to come until I leave. I got to go so that he can come. But when he comes, you're going to be given a gift. And the gift is that now you will have the advocate, the helper, the counselor, the encourager, the comforter, and some even say the mediator. As Jesus has done all of this work, he recognizes that the disciples by themselves, if they are not given any additional help, they won't be able to make it. God knew that the road he was going to put you on would be difficult. God knew that you wouldn't be able to do it all by yourself. God figured that there will be some times where you will get pretty low. That there'll be some times where you wouldn't feel all right. That there'll be some times where stuff just didn't make sense. And you would need somebody, something there to help you. He says, let me make sure that you know before I go, I'm going to send the one that can do all of the stuff that you will need to finish and complete the journey. I know you need help. I'm going to send you the helper. I know you need an advocate. I'm going to send you an advocate. I know sometimes life makes you depressed and when everything is going on, it don't seem like you know how you're going to make it. But can I tell you, I've already planned for this. I've given you an encourager to lift up your head when everything in life has tried to push you down. There's an encourager. As we live in this current dispensation, listening and hearing the great tragedies and the complete depravity that is all around us. As we hear about the evils of gun violence, Buffalo, New York, Southern California, Uvalde, Texas, to name a few because they've been plentiful. It gets even worse that then you hear stuff as if a 911 dispatcher think somebody is playing because they're whispering. So they potentially disconnect a distress call because somebody in need is whispering. And an already terrible situation gets even worse. We hear about children waiting in a school with parents outside and police waiting outside while children are being mowed down. where parents are saying things like, you give me your gear. Give me your gun. I'll go get my child myself. And it seems as if all of life is weighing us down. There's every reason for us to be depressed, every reason for us to be concerned, every reason for us to be worried. Yet the gift is God has already given his spirit 
so that in moments of depression, the encourager can be actualized on the inside of us that says, don't you give up now? Don't you stop right here? Don't you think it's over? Yes, it's terrible, but I'm still God. I'm still able. I'm still available. He raises up in the moments that we need him. He raises up when we lose our children. He, he raises up when we've lost loved ones. He raises up when we've lost that job. He raises. He says, I've, I've already got a gift plan for you. And it's coming for you. Because I know that this life is going to be terrible. Let me tell you, there is no need for God to send the spirit of God unless he already knew it was going to be hard. So every single time you go through a challenge and difficulty in life, it is not coming against or contradicting God. It is actually proving God to be even more true and even more foretelling and has already foreshadowed what you would need and then should give you the glory and the joy to say that my God saw this day already and even back on Calvary was planning to make sure I would be able to keep. He says, there's a gift, and it's coming, but you got to stay in Jerusalem and wait. And just push pin here. Let me tell you, there's a difference in waiting on the Lord and demonic delay. It is demonic delay that we have legislation for gun control sitting on death and not moving forward. That ain't God telling us to wait. That's something we can do right now. You can fix that. We can change that. It is demonic delay that we're watching young men consistently think that the only way to deal with difficulty in life is to take a gun and go shoot some people. We can fix that. We can do something. That's just demonic delay. And we don't have to put God's name on it. We need to claim it. And we are to change it. It's ridiculous. And then we want to act like when will the Lord move? The Lord has already moved. He's already given you the ability. Don't ask him to do stuff that you can do on your own. Demonic delay. And we're seeing the carnage. When our kids are scared to learn. People don't go to church now because they worried about somebody shooting up a church. Demonic delay. And we ought to call it what it is. And every single time we don't do the right thing, we are participating in the kingdom of darkness and not the kingdom of light, period. Jesus didn't tell them, lean into demonic delay. But he says, I'm, I'm asking you to give me the faithful waiting that comes with trusting me that I've given it to you. Watch this. Because the Holy Spirit not only is advocate, comforter, encourager, counselor, but is the Spirit of God that leads us to truth. We have misunderstood facts and truth. Facts are the things that happen. Truth is the understanding of what those facts mean. And the problem is, is that we've learned how to use facts to prove whatever we desire to prove. But it's the Spirit of God that lifts it up and tells you, no, that ain't right. No, that's not God's way. No, that's not what he desires. No, it is not okay. Do not get used to anything that God has not said this should happen. You got to make sure that the Spirit of God grabs you the truth. This is why we should be broken heart is still when we see poverty. Facts will tell us it has to be this way. Based upon the system, this is the only way that things work. Truth tells us is that's not true. 
Yes, it is true this is a byproduct, but there are a thousand other things that we can do to start working towards it, fixing it, and making a better way. There's resources available, not just for mental health. And can I say this, and, and, and crucify me if you need to, every single time something evil happens, it is not due to mental health. That is a degradation to people who are really suffering. Stop it. Sometimes you just evil, participating in evil, and we need to call evil evil. And then we wonder why there's stigmas to all of the mental health. Because if you think I'm that, then surely don't call me that. Yes, we struggle. Yes, we all go through stuff. But let me tell you, when your response to that is something evil, it's still evil. And God knows we can help. We can help with mental health. We can help by first making it okay to talk about it in sanctuaries and amongst other people. I know that, that we have the terminology we used to call everybody crazy. They think I'm crazy, but sometimes I am crazy. And two ways to use that. Sometimes crazy knowing exactly what I'm doing, I chose to do it anyway. Sometimes crazy where it's completely out of my control. And I need help. And I need the church not to just talk about me. Not to publicize my failures and my fallings so that this is a place where I get whooped just like I get whooped everywhere else. But this ought to be the place where you can come and find sanctuary where the people of God and the Spirit of God is so available, so accessible that everybody in the presence begins to change. He says, he leads us to truth convince us about sin, that this is a, a gift to give us power. But he closes with this, that you might be witnesses. Out of all that he gives, all that comes, it's the ability to be witnesses. In fact, Acts chapter 2, as much as so often we get stuck on the tongue's portion the ability to speak in languages that are not known, the glossa, if you will, the glossa only showed up so that they could be witnesses. Watch this. I believe Jesus wanted them to stay in Jerusalem because at this moment, there are so many groups of people in Jerusalem that if they stay there for the Spirit, that when they testify, the way by which this message will travel will be different than if they go back to their own locations by themselves. Right. What are you saying? That they are just like us. We constantly go around people that we like and people that are like us. But God had no intention for the gospel to just be for people like us. He wanted the gospel to get to everybody. In fact, he tells them this, that you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and even in Samaria. And hear that, because remember, Samaria is the place they don't like to go. Samaria are the people they don't love. Samaria are those folks they call dogs. And he says, when I leave, y'all about to go preach to the dogs. But in Jerusalem... On this day, folks from all over are there. So what happens to the gospel when all of them hear the gospel and go back home? All of a sudden, spread happens in a way that it couldn't have happened if they kept it to themselves. Stay right here, because guess what? Sometimes you're waiting not just for you. I'm talking to the camera because I know y'all don't want to hear this. I'm talking to the camera. You believe your life is just about you. And God has created and valued your life to be a part of the whole. The reason why the whole is giving gifts. So there are some times where God holds you in challenging situations, not just for you, but because there's somebody watching you, somebody listening to you, somebody seeing you, 
and your response in that moment becomes the testimony to the God you say that you serve. What would happen if people started getting saved on our jobs, not just because we out there showing off our Bible on our desk or on our Zoom platform, but because they saw the way that the boss came after us, they saw the way the company tried to tank us, they saw the way that the enemy surrounded us, but yet you kept standing, you kept smiling you were in peace and they said I need to find whatever it is that you got because I'm going through it and you seem to have it what you got open up the conversation for the gospel he says go and be witnesses go and be billboards go and tell them go and tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is Lord because God has done it so one of my favorite restaurants, right? One of my favorite restaurants is relatively expensive, expensive, so I don't go often. It's a place called Maestro's. It's supposed to be opening at, uh, I'm sorry, Mastro's. It's supposed to be opening at Valley Fair. It has not opened for like a year and a half. It's making me angry. But, you know, we go there and they have great food. I mean, absolutely great food. It's expensive, but great food. But the thing that blew me away wasn't just their main course. It wasn't their appetizers. It wasn't all the, the, the other stuff that they bring around when I tell you, this place has a dessert that will blow your mind. They got this butter cake, okay? And, and this butter cake, man, it's, it's holy, okay? The Spirit of God showed up for this butter cake, you understand me? They make a homemade whipped cream to put on top of it, uh-huh. Then they put some fresh fruit on top of it, and as soon as you slice through it, it begins to melt as you grab it and put it into your mouth. Let me tell you, I've told more people about this butter cake than I've ever told about the main course. And what if God had some people that said he liked this butter cake? I, can I tell you about some butter cake? Can I tell you about a God that he's so good every time I ta taste and see that the Lord is good. That's all he wants. You ain't got to make up no stories. You don't have to lie about them. You don't have to have the full command of every single scripture. But all you got to do is say, can I tell you what the Lord has done for me? Can I tell you where the Lord found me? Can I tell you how the Lord has saved me? I wish I had a church that could testify about the goodness of my Say, I know when I was going through my lowest, let me tell you what he did for me. When I didn't have the money, let me tell you what he did for me. When I was down in depression, let me tell you what he did for me. When he found me and I needed to be saved and he cleaned me up and he picked me up and he set my feet on a good common ground. I want to, I wish that we would just tell folks about the gift of God. That's all you got to do. And let me tell you, you can sit down. I promise I'm done. <laughs> Listen. And don't let the ideas of being politically correct stop your witness. <clears throat> Listen, hear, hear me, hear me, hear me. Sometimes we've allowed things that actually could be good to be used for ne negative. I'm not saying you got to go out and try to teach theology classes at your job. But when given the opportunity, if somebody asks you how, who, what, ain't no law to say, well, let me tell you. It was the Lord who was on my side. I, I don't know what you understand. In fact, I'm not trying to make you disbelieve. You might be an atheist, but can I tell you, it wasn't anybody but God that showed up when I was sitting at the table to sign. It was nobody but God that opened up the door. It was nobody but God that made sure I didn't kill myself. It was nobody but the Lord. And this is the other thing. And watch this. This is how the enemy gets us every single time. He also knows 
that soon as you say that, you become a model. And you begin to look over your life and you say, whoa, if I say this, they're going to expect that. I better be quiet because I know I'm not living up to that. And this is the reason why the Lord gave us the spirit of God to actually produce the fruit because he knew that you wouldn't be able to talk about him rightly unless you were living about him rightly. But we keep acting like church is trying to make you be something negative. Church is trying to help you intensify your witness, but you get mad if somebody holds you accountable. That's another thing. But watch this. Scripture says it is the Holy Spirit that convicts. So, even in our brokenness, we can still testify to the goodness of God. We can't, we don't have to just testify when we think we're good. Because then that leads us into arrogance. But it is in the humility of our honesty that we can tell the truth. Listen, it's nobody but God that has done this for me. <laughs> And I don't even live right all the time. I'm out there all messed up. God is still working on this area of my life. And to be honest, I'm still trying to get this together. But can I tell you, despite me not having it together, I got a God that loved me enough that even when I was messed up, even when I was still, even though when I didn't do this, even over there, he still showed up. And I got to tell you, if you want a God that can give you freedom, you ain't got to be perfect. You ain't got to know it all. You ain't got to live it all. All you got to do is say, save me. Nothing more is needed. You don't need more of God. You don't need a brand new idea or theological perspective. He gave you the spirit. Everything you need becomes available. The same spirit that hovered over the dawn of creation the same spirit that will come upon folks in the Old Testament and give them strength beyond measure. The same spirit that woke a dead savior up out of a grave has come to give you power. So, I ask again, desert anyone. Pray with me.